I am Tim Cavanaugh, Managing Editor of Reason Online, and uh, we have uh, quite a guest list here, so um, should we just uh, start? Everybody ready to go? Uh, Ethan, do you want to take the lead? Hey, Tim, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Ethan Adelman. Um, so this was the idea behind this roundtable, which was we wanted to be addressing controversies within the movement. You know, as we grow as a movement, inevitably we got to hash things out among ourselves, dynamics change. And one of the things that's really been changing in the movement in, in recent years is that there's now a legal, semi-legal, not quite legal, medical marijuana industry that has emerged in very significant ways that probably has revenues that are in the hundreds of millions, if not much more, some of which are paying taxes. Um, and it's shaping what's happening with marijuana reform in America, right? It's playing a role when we look at drafting initiatives in Colorado or California or other states where dispensary owners are already a political force. Uh, it's the question of where the money is coming from. So in the back in the 90s, it was basically three billionaires who weren't particularly caring about the details, and now there's a lot more. There's the issues around whether or not people involved in the marijuana industry may oppose legalization initiatives because of the fears around this stuff. There's the issues about to what extent should legalization aim to protect what's happened with medical marijuana? To what extent should, are there conflicts between the interests of the consumers and the patients and those of the growers and those of the dispensary operators? So I've begun to see these things and been party to these conflicts playing out. Ultimately, my job at DPA is to try to keep everybody focused on the long-term vision and where we're going, but those are the sorts of issues we hope would be discussed and argued about on this panel. Terrific. Uh, so should we start? Uh, Mike uh, Elliott, do you want to start us off? Sure. Is this on? Can you hear me, everybody? Great. Thanks for uh, having me here. My name is Mike Elliott. I'm the executive director of the Medical Marijuana Industry Group. We are uh, based in Colorado. We're a trade association. We have about 30 members or so that they all basically pay, do, pay dues into the group, and we have used those dues to hire lobbyists to um, basically advocate for sensible uh, marijuana policy in Colorado. Um, our group, now this was actually before I was executive du director, but in 2010 it was uh, members of my groups and their lobbyists that helped pass the Colorado regulatory framework uh, that we currently have in place today. And it was those lobbyists that uh, um, were really instrumental in passing another bill, the cleanup bill, this last, uh, this last winter and, and spring of 2011, and also defeating a, um, a proposed five nanogram per se marijuana DUI law as well. Um, to sum it up, we're talking about money and I, I guess my feeling here is that in Colorado, I, I know I've actually said this several times around the conference to folks, but we have not had the federal governments interfere once with uh, those patients or providers in unambiguous compliance with the state law, not once. And part of what is, what is really working about the Colorado system is the strong state regulatory framework. And that would not have gotten in place if it wasn't for, I believe, uh, the lobbyists, the, the, the industry coming together, investing money into smart uh, strategic lobbying efforts that, that basically created this, this, uh, this regulatory framework. Now, this did not have to happen this way. Um, there was talk at that time, before the regulatory framework was put into place, that our Attorney General, John Southers, who's, I think we all consider him to be the number one opponent of marijuana in the state, uh, was trying to shut everything down after the Ogden memo, basically, just shut everything down. And instead, what we were able to do, because we were smart, because of the relationships that the lobbyists built up with the elected officials, and because we made good arguments, we turned it from being a complete ban of everything into a a tax, regulate, license, make it secure, a make it controlled um, bill. So to get, you know, I guess I'll, I'll sum it up here, right. but uh, I, I think that money played a, a very strong role in creating what um, I would see as being uh, probably the strongest model in the country and something that, though far from being perfect, that uh, um, everyone else can look to, to, to learn from our mistakes and, and, and then replicate what's worked. 
Well, as a Californian, I can say it would be nice to live in a state where the federal government has not interfered with the uh, legitimate operations. Uh, so maybe Stephen D'Angelo, uh, probably the next, uh, is next in the row and, and is well positioned to talk to this issue. He is uh, the executive director of Harborside Health Center in Oakland. And uh, he had, uh, Stephen, you had some really interesting comments at a conference we, we co-paneled last year about you know bringing in black market, former black market people, how do you sort of uh, make all that work? So take it away. All right, well, thanks very much, Tim. Uh, and uh, just a quick word of thanks to Ethan and to uh, everybody at DPA, You're doing an amazing job, um, and for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I think that uh, when we talk about money <coughs> in the movement, we need to recognize that there's many different ways that money comes into our movement. Uh, they all have their strengths and their weaknesses. Whether money is coming in from the grassroots or from high net worth donors or from industry donations uh, or from another uh, source of what I consider to be industry or movement funding that's often overlooked, uh, social entrepreneurship, uh, all of those methods of getting money into the movement have their strengths and their weaknesses. What they have in common is that the source of funding inevitably is going to have a large degree of influence on the policy and the strategy uh, of whatever it is that it's funding, whatever organization, campaign, effort, initiative. Um, this is, of course, true with the new source, uh, or at least potential new source of funding that's coming into the movement from the legal medical cannabis industry. And uh, I hope we get a chance to talk a little bit more about the strengths and weaknesses of that source of funding. Um, uh, and also a little bit more about the other way that the medical cannabis industry contributes to the movement financially, uh, ultimately, which is through a lot of social entrepreneurship activities. So, thanks. Terrific. Next is Debbie Goldsberry, United mm -hmm. Cannabis Collective in San Francisco. Hi there. Um, let's see. Well, I got my first uh, grant from the Drug Policy Foundation back in 1990. And uh, with that, founded the Cannabis Action Network, quickly understood that we needed to make our own money uh, and have experience in raising funds in every kind of way, events, selling stickers, books, you name it. Um, Steve D'Angelo was kind enough to donate his uh, proceeds from his hemp company to the Cannabis Action Network for many years and really funded our work uh, around the country. And those people that know Cannabis Action Network know that we were instrumental in helping inspire the work of the MPP and SSDP and, and really um, helped to grow together the modern uh, cannabis movement that that has gone so far. I have founded the Berkeley Patients Group. Um, at Berkeley Patients Group, we were very successful in doing that thing we all talked about probably since like Fat Freddy's cat in the 60s, like what if everyone gave a dollar from their bat eighth of pot to legalize cannabis? We'd have it, you know, we'd ha have it legal by now. So BPG was able to donate a um, million dollars into the community while I was a director at Berkeley Patients Group, which is which is huge to, to make our own money and to give it back uh, for our own sustainability, to bootstrap and fund our own future, I think is extremely important. Um, I got back to nonprofit work recently and have been working in San Jose on this referendum campaign. And I'll tell you, we wouldn't have done it if we weren't working organized with our finances. We had 30 days to repeal a bad law. We had to collect 50,000 signatures in 30 days. To do that, we had to raise $200,000. Um, the collectives and the patients raised that money, mainly themselves, but we did, at the end, come to our um, dependable friends here at the Drug Policy Alliance and through the other drug policy organizations like MPP helping. Um, we were able to, uh, to collect those signatures in 30 days. Um, but uh, all the, so I like the fact that we're making money and giving it back to the community. So then the bad, because I think we get to argue sometime. I don't know what we're going to argue about. Let's argue. Okay, the bad part that I see. This is the bad. Okay, because there's bad. You know, when the money comes around, it's really hard. It's human nature. How do we not get greedy? You know, and I, I, I wonder if we're going to be able to sur survive as a counterculture and as a community of people like Jack Herrera's original vision. Hemp can save the planet. Um, hemp can save the planet, but not if we turn our attention to making money, and not if we forget that we're fighting a war on drugs and start focusing our dispensary activities on turning into business without realizing we need to be socially responsible businesses that give back to our community and that we keep giving our dollars back to the movement so that we can change the laws or we're all going down. And I think that that's a path 
that we started down naively and didn't realize the power and the pull of greed and how fun it is to have power and it's a big danger right now. The other thing is, is there's sharks circling our movement. When we're interacting with business people, we work with a couple of billionaires because they're cool. It's, you know, because we can't just go out and get our money from business people. We have to get our money from socially responsible business people. And the other type of business people are here trying to give us their money. And I've seen the contracts and they're dastardly. You're giving up not only your business, not only the future, not only your profit. You don't know that they're going to take your business one day because they're a lot smarter. They're business people. Um, and uh, I bet you're going to sign away your soul too. So I think we have to be really careful at this essential time when we need the money that we remember that we're a movement that's giving back money to end the war on drugs. It's not over till our friends and our family are out of jail. And this thing is over, it's not over till it's over. If you're running a cannabis business, run it responsibly and let's, let's make our businesses socially responsible businesses and our nonprofits intelligent business organizations. And then we're gonna win this thing. Next up is Kate Haleva from the Montana uh, uh, the Cannabis Industry Association. Sorry. Hi. Um, in Montana, uh, we had a very dynamic um, cannabis marketplace. Uh, there was a lot of innovation going on. We had labs. We had very sophisticated manufacturers, a lot of PhDs. It was about a $7 million a month industry is what we uh, estimated in Montana. We went into the legislative session, and even with 30,000 patients, um, I would say everybody was operating on a shoestring, a lot of people working for free uh, during our um, time of lobbying, and, which isn't to say we did not have professionals. We actually, um, I've been lobbying for 20 years, Tom Dobear has been lobbying for 40 years, so we, we did have a lot of experience on the ground. Um, and there were a lot of competing regulatory models because when the initiative passed, it was a very loose parameters. Um, which means that our system got to evolve really based on what does it take to get the supply to the demand within some very broad parameters. So they actually got to build a system in some ways based on the market and how it behaved and being responsive to it, which I think we really don't see anymore when people get their six distributors, you know, or these very artificial ways of creating a, a system. We actually got to in some ways have an organic approach. Um, when there, so we had many, we had a couple regulatory models. Um, we had, however, we also had repeal bill out there. While our Senate Judiciary Committee was voting on that repeal bill, we had um, 26 uh, simultaneous raids executed in Montana. That would be the equivalent of about 963 on the same morning in California. Um, and after that, in our legislature, there was no conversation about regulating. The conversation was about how do we stop this scourge. And as a result, the legislation that passed took, all, took the money out. That was the big conversation. We have to take the money out. So um, the law that passed had many terrible provisions, but one of the key ones was no money. The Montana Cannabis Industry Association, that was the last bill to pass of the session. The next day we came together, we raised $50,000 in a weekend to secure the services of a very high profile lawyer in Montana who sought a temporary injunction. We got several provisions enjoined, um, one of them, um, the, Interestingly, it wasn't the ones that hurt patients that got enjoined. The, what got enjoined were the things that interfered with commerce. So I thought that was a very interesting message from the courts, um, and one that makes sense when you look at our system. So anyway, so we've been working under this legislation as enjoined. Um, we've been trying to raise, the, the, those who have supported the effort in Montana have been the businesses. Um, patient consumers have made contributions, of course, but it has been the businesses that have supported it. I think a wonderful thing is my history in politics is human services, poverty issues, death with dignity. You know, I've gone after, in some ways, taxpayer dollars through the appropriations process for programs. So right now, I'm working in a social justice movement that actually has a funding source. Uh, built into it, and I think that that's a really good thing um, as someone who's fought for money um, to try to take care of things. So um, all social justice movements are economic movements, ultimately, civil rights, women's rights, and um, so is this. It's about who has the resources, and is it the middle class citizens, or is it the prohibition industries? Rob Campia, Marijuana Policy Project. <clears throat> Thank you. So, I, you know, I want to take a maybe a slightly different point of view on this whole topic. I, I think that the, uh, 
the role of industry money in this movement is greatly overstated. Uh, you know, just doing some back of the envelope math, uh, the gross revenues for the medical marijuana industry are a, probably a couple billion dollars annually. Um, the number of dollars that, let's say, DPA, ASA, MPP, and the National Cannabis Industry Association collectively spend in a year on medical marijuana is a couple million dollars. So if you take a couple million dollars of actual policy work and divide by a couple billion dollars of gross revenues, you could sort of say that, all right, 0.1% of the gross revenues in the industry is associated with policy change. But even then, it's not the couple million dollars that Ethan and me and a couple of other groups are spending isn't even coming from the industry anyway, for the most part. You know, I'm sure that I'll let Ethan speak for himself, but their work in Connecticut and New Jersey was almost exclusively not funded by the industry. The, the work that we were, the medical marijuana bills that we just passed in the last year in Maryland, Vermont, and Delaware was not funded at all by the industry. The initiative that we passed in Arizona a year ago was not funded by the industry. Not to say that industry players are not funding things, it is true. But to put it in perspective, if you look at the total number of businesses, whether they're dispensaries, growers, kitchens, testing facilities, I estimate, and I talked to Steph Shear about this yesterday just to make sure I was not going to speak out of turn. She and I both agree that less than 2% of the businesses in this community are donating something. 98% donating nothing. So there are some good players who are donating as much as they can, and we thank them, and some of them are in this room. And I don't want to take away from that. There's some rock stars who are all, you know, working these businesses, and they're also philanthropists, and that's great. But 98% are not. And that's unfortunate, because as a result, what could be an ex enormously powerful movement, lobbying state legislatures, and lobbying Congress, is actually still a small movement. So it could be much bigger. Now, the money has played a, a key role in, in a few areas. I'll just name two. One is in California, where Richard Lee funded almost the entire signature drive for Prop 19. That was industry money getting dumped into a political campaign. And whether or not you liked how that initiative was drafted, we can all agree that that money put the question on the ballot. It turned it into a national debate. It failed with 46.5%, but it changed the dynamic of how this conversation has been occurring over the last year. So that was money that was actually very relevant. And the other example I'll give before I hand over the microphone is that in Montana, uh, I think that the reason that you saw such a backlash amongst the legislature to try to repeal the law that we passed in 2004 in Montana is because there were some industry players there that were irresponsible. Uh, you know, one was there's this traveling circus around the state giving group recommendations, the doctor giving recommendations to 300 patients at a time. I mean, it's, it's totally inappropriate. It's, you know, it's, it, it was sort of akin to a TV evangelist saving a million people at the same time. Uh, you know, that's not how it was intended. It was supposed to be a doctor-patient relationship. And I think that offended a lot of people, even though, of course, a lot of patients got recommendations in the process. Another problem with what happened in Montana that I think helped cause the backlash is that there were some businesses that were really poorly run, had a bad facade, where they were located right next to schools or across from parks. Uh, and uh, where kids were playing. And, and, and so just some of those businesses, not all, uh, were poorly run, and legislators from those communities were getting a lot of pressure to close them down. And so that's an, these are instances in Montana, not to pick on my new friend I just met here from Montana because she's on the right side of this, but... <laughs> but, 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 I, but, but I think and hope you will agree that there were some irresponsible players in Montana that helped cause the problem in the legislature and that could have been avoided if these business owners were acting more responsibly. Ted Trimpa, president of the Trimpa Group. From my perspective, I think you actually should embrace the money. And why I say that is if the ultimate goal is drug policy reform, and we know that policies are determined by elected officials or public officials that are appointed by elected officials. They're part of a system that is funded with money. And we live in a market-based economy that's regulated by rules set by public officials who are elected with money. Then we should be using it to our advantage. And I don't think that we use it to our advantage enough. And I speak from experience from the gay rights movement and what we started with about an effort seven years ago to start taking money, putting it into politics, electing the right people, defeating the right people, 
playing in the right power circles, as much as we, I'm assuming most of you are as left as I am, as much as many of us would be offended by that and that kind of culture, we sometimes have to play that dynamic in order to get what is the right thing to do. And what you have today in the United States is we have 43% of the people now live in a state that has some form of relationship recognition. Six years ago, that was a single digit number. We need to be doing the same thing. It's often why, and Ethan quoted me on it, I say weed is the new gay, because it is. And we have an opportunity to really take that money and use it to good. Now the caution is money from whom and what interest is involved. And I think this is part of what Ethan pointed out earlier. You're gonna have industry money for the medical uh, marijuana industry. You're going to have donor money. And as pe people know, philanthropists are great, but they're also fickle. You know, many of them think that they have every solution to every problem in the world. And if only everybody did what they said because they're rich, so therefore they're smart, all good things would happen. And sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. But again, you play that dynamic where they not fight it. And then the grassroots money and the grassroots support. And I think what is important to remember is that you need to, and from my perspective, balance out the three. And just be really transparent on the front end about what's going on and what you're trying to do. Because if, in the end, you believe that good public policy happens on its own, well, then you are high. <laughs> it doesn't. I know. Well, yeah, there's pretty interesting, I think it's only an e-book, but uh, Andrew Sullivan's uh, readers put together a big uh, oral history called The Cannabis Closet that's all about uh, sort of everybody's private history of being a pot smoker and, you know, all the kind of weird self-hatred and secrecy that comes with uh, having to do it on, the, on a sub rosa level. Last, we have our host, Ethan Nadelman. Okay, Tim, thanks. So I guess part of what I feel myself struggling with now is, is how to integrate all of the, the new money and interest in this. And I think, you know, for, for part of my start as a, sort of in, my, as a, in my evolution from academic to an activist was in the mid-90s. And it was the opportunity to pull together a number of billionaires, right? George Soros and Peter Lewis and John Sperling. And in the case of California, not quite a billionaire, but George Zimmer, the men's warehouse guy. And, and in 1996 in California, you know, Dennis Perone and some of his group had the vision of Prop 215, um, but not the capability. And I was able to pull together these rich guys and uh, put together the financial partnership of $2 million and, and, you know, and then we, and hire a professional campaign manager, Bill Zimmerman, and we won the thing, right? We, we, it transformed this thing. And then to pull together that, that same group, and then in 98, 99, 2000, to be able to so go to Alaska and Oregon and Washington and Colorado, Nevada and Maine and do the same thing and really open this thing up. Now, when we were drafting these things, you know, it was all about None of the donors, right, had any financial interest in this stuff. For them, it was, you know, Peter Lewis cared more about the marijuana piece. George Soros was more about the intersection of, of death and dying with dignity together with medical marijuana in the, in the pain piece. John Sperling was more against the whole drug war. George, George Zimmer more about the marijuana thing. So there were mixed interests, but nobody had any pecuniary interest in this thing. And when we were drafting, it was all about Let's get local activists, local attorneys, national perspective, and how far can we push this thing, right, um, and still win? And those were the fights, you know. Can, how far can we push the, the amount of marijuana, the grow, the pieces, you know? And we made our mistakes, and when you look back at these initiatives, you see all the things we should have done back then, but at least it was that first wave, right? And though, but now, Right now, you still have to some extent, as Rob pointing out, still the big money is probably still going to come from big guys who care about this as a matter of principle and don't care about the details all that much. But what we are dealing with is, you know, now in a Colorado or a California or some other state, it's like, well, what do the dispensary owners think about this? I mean, these are guys sometimes making a lot of money, sometimes not. Sometimes they've invested a lot of money hoping for return. Some of them are personally in favor of legalization but very scared about what legalization could mean for their own current interests. Um, some of them are looking for ways to, to have in the legalization initiative some language that may protect the dispensary industry. And then, of course, you have the growers 
Whole another piece. Growers who, sometimes multi-generational growers in Humboldt or Mendocino, and they're going, oh my God, everything's moving from uh, outdoor grow to indoor grow, and our family tradition's gonna be wiped out as we're gonna have the Marlboroization and Budweiserization of marijuana, and then you have the conspiracy theories about the DuPont money, I mean, all this stuff coming, at, you know, uh, you know, you know, coming around. And so, from Drug Policy Alliance's perspective, you know, we've typically been focused on our core thing is the individual, the individual marijuana consumer, right? That that person, A, should not be criminalized, should be legal, and B, should have a legal right and ability to access marijuana from some source, whether it's your home grow or it's some other source. So we work from there, not from the perspective of the seller Right, the sell, I mean, the seller is kind of, it, it's the individual consumer first, the producer second, and then the, then the distributor last. But it's a matter of trying to play out and balance the, the, these interests right now, and that's part of the struggle. Never mind the fact of people who are on one side of this thing now beginning to, like what happened to Humboldt Mendocino, right, opposing Prop uh, 19 because of their fears about what would happen, right? And I, I understand, you know, they're worried about a, a livelihood being taken away Yet on the other hand, we live in a country where almost 800,000 people arrested for marijuana possession last year, and where there's a multi-billion dollar you know, violent industry out of Mexico, and where there's billions of dollars of lost tax revenue, and cops, I mean, all this stuff. So, so that's my, I'm just being out front with my struggle. And I should also, by the way, just say, because this is, this is meant to deal with controversy in the movement, and we are in a way airing some of our dirty laundry and our internal conflicts, but also keep in mind that there are some very sophisticated journalists sitting in the audience who will probably write about this in the major media tomorrow or the next day. So we have to take that into account well, while we at the same time have this open conversation. <laughs> Terrific. Yeah, I, I want to add. <laughs> I, I want to add a, 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 an additional perspective that I'm not for sure Ethan will agree or disagree, but I think part of the challenge we face today is that a lot of what we have was do-gooding funding and people really committed to a cause and we kind of got the ball rolling down the hill. The challenge is, is that because the country hasn't quite caught up with what marijuana means, and what really is a rational approach to this, whether you go a legalization path, whether you go a more wellness path, or you go a more medical marijuana path, the way to make sure that the regulatory structures or the statutory structures, no matter which one you pick, actually get maintained and we kind of fight the forces of evil sometimes requires someone to have a financial interest in ensuring that this, that this gets better and it keeps going. Because our challenge is, that the, it, the, the motivations for the funding sources don't always necessarily continue to follow through with what happens in an individual state. Um, and I, it's, it's the harsh reality of it, but I think it's something that we have to have an honest conversation about, and from my perspective, embrace, but embrace with transparency. Could I uh, just put a question to anybody on the panel? Uh, to what extent are we uh, hamstrung by the nonprofit uh, system that we are, at least in California, are obliged to operate under. And I think that that sort of affects us in two ways. In LA, uh, does everybody, anybody know Councilman Bernard Parks, LA's most underrated man? Um, he, I have driven around his district where he goes around pointing out all of the churches and saying, none of these places are doing us any good because they don't generate any tax revenue. And uh, you know it's bad for my district because I don't get as much back from the city because I don't generate as much taxes. We can debate whether there should be more or fewer churches, but uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the same principle applies with dispensaries. I mean, we get no support from local politicians because they never get to wet their beaks. There's nothing in it for them to be uh, friendly to dispensaries. And the other thing would be just a more uh, out front. I mean, you, Rob, you mentioned only 2% of the industry. In effect, there really isn't an industry. I mean, until you have an industry that seeks profit, do you really have an industry at all? Well, but, you know, just to, to address that nonprofit issue, in some ways now, you know, I worked at Berkeley Patients Group for 11 years. It was quite a frustration to constantly be dealing with this 
this language, which is very vague. It doesn't just say nonprofit, it says not for profit, which of course isn't defined by law, it's not a defined term. And then it says collective or cooperative, well collective's also not defined by law. So technically you could be a collective not for profit, what does that mean? And how do you prove it if that's what you are? Because you're legal if you are, but there's no definition, so it gets complex. But where the rubber hits the road is when you're trying to expand or bring funds into your collective, um, say you have to relocate or you want to uh, have a special project or something like that, uh, raising funds for a nonprofit organization that's a collective, it's nearly impossible, you know, because you have to get a loan, you can't get investors, you know, we somewhat look like a straight up business, so you would think the investors think they should invest in us. That means they get 33% control of, of the profits. And, and on the nonprofit, you know, because that's what investors do when they go out and invest. In nonprofits, then you're bound by the usury laws. So you can borrow money, but they only get 10% back. Well, who's going to loan money to a nonprofit? profit organization that's about to get busted by the feds at 10% return, there's no money for expansion. So even the best organizations out there that are kind of those one or two percenters that are really giving back, as we try and go out and get the funds to expand so that we can make more not-for-profit collective enterprises so we can bring more money into the movement, we're finding it nearly impossible to raise the funds for expansion. You know, is there any extent to which, uh, when, when there's a legalization process, and we saw this with prohibition, there's obviously a huge regulation of the market, or not regulation, but a, a correction in the market that takes place, where what used to be illegal suddenly plummets in price. We've seen that in California. I, 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 I'm not sure whether or not I know people whose uh, profits have really tanked because they used to just sell, you know, Somebody come by your apartment, you buy a bag of weed, and now it, you know it's a lot. There are a lot more competition. The price is dropping in California, and that's a process. It's almost like it's better to take all the pain up front instead of dragging it out through this long process that involves all these multiple hypocrisies like we have now. I mean, would it be better if the if if we just got to an open market where everybody would know here's what you know what the price is based on what people are willing to pay? I got a couple of comments. Um, uh, first of all, I think that the, probably the single uh, most effective thing that we could do to bring money into the industry and therefore into the movement would be to switch California from nonprofit to profit making. I can tell you that I know uh, that there are already in Colorado um, significant uh, hedge fund and private equity investors who are active in the marketplace there. They are very, very well politically connected people who have been driving policy and legal change for years and years and years uh, in a, uh, to advance their business interests. Uh, they have all of the money that this industry could ever need. Uh, and uh, they are just beginning to get active in Colorado. They're hampered there partly by the restrictions on out-of-state investors. But there are a lot of people like that who would be eager to jump into California, and they would certainly uh, put some very serious money uh, um, at the disposal of, of political change. Can I say something about how we've thought about nonprofits in Montana largely is just is that a structure that helps protect people potentially from being raided? I mean, that's, that's, that's right. is our discussion, you know, does it make it somehow a more palatable thing? And I just want to make some, some other comments, and, and I agree with that there's very few businesses in Montana who are supporting everything. Um, so some things you said, my, my former new friend, Ron Campia said um, <laughs> earlier. Um, so, so, uh, so, oh, Rob. <laughs> uh, well, we just met. Um, anyways, so, um, so, so we have, um, you know, so the money is coming from very few people uh, to support things in Montana. And we would love it if some rich people wanted to come in and give us money and then get that ugly old business money out of the movement. That would be great, you know, but that has not happened in Montana. We've gotten very little money. I know that there was money back in 2004, but that, that has not been the situation. And in fact, we've even been in some ways teased with big money coming in. That put us in a very difficult situation recently um, where we ended up, you know, having to run a campaign based on a different outcome than we thought we were starting with, doing it with all volunteers, and we succeeded in, in, in a partial way in getting this terrible law that passed back on the ballot. 
Um, but we did that with you know, a volunteer force um, after, under the expectation that we were gonna have support to do something that would, would have been a goal that made more sense for us in Montana. So um, you know, this idea of making business money somehow dirtier, um, not reputable in some way, when it's the only money right now protecting patients, you know, the patient consumer in our state. So anyway. I think we're facing a big challenge. You know, we all know that equity doesn't just happen. We have to work for equity. We have to work for equality. We can't just pretend that that's not the truth. The natural way things go, fewer and less people end up with control of the resources and control of the profit. Well, I'm a 25-year activist in this movement, and and it really concerns me that that in the long run, in a few years, we might see cannabis controlled by what, a couple dozen people, if they had their way? Um, I think that would be a big problem, and I think it would be a huge disservice. And for example, in Humboldt County, or I think it was Mendo, I went to this Emerald Cannabis Cup where the outdoor cultivators came together, uh, and they booed Ed Rosenthal off the stage, basically, when he started talking about legalizing cannabis, because it looked to them like that meant they were all out of a job, and that's the only economy in Northern California that they can use to feed their families. And if we're not working actively in our program to make sure that we're creating equality so that everybody that wants to participate has a place to participate, then, then we're going to see our own people working against us. And what I find myself saying in the communities I work in is, yeah, San Jose, maybe you think 10 big cultivation facilities is going to be the way to go, but you're completely wrong. I mean, not only are you putting a target on top of that facility and the feds are going to come wipe them out, but what about the hundreds of patients that that have surplus in their homes that need to come someplace. You know, what about the families that have, you know, four or five generations of cultivating cannabis in their, at, in their homes or in their backyards or in small cottage industries? How can we make sure that this type of innovation leads us into the future? And it scares me when people with a lot of uh, loud voices in this movement um, are going for these permits and then they're talking about limiting access to permits. And when you see the laws being created by the people that have the money to be in there and playing at the table writing the laws, but they're writing the laws for themselves to the exclusion of other people. That's the type of thing we have to be aware of and we have to put the equity plan in place so that we can speak with both voices. Somebody said we have to be in three different places at once, grassroots, top down, and, and the middle ground. So let's make sure that we use all those voices. W wouldn't wouldn't full legalization, at least generally along the lines of Prop 19, actually eliminate the problem you mentioned of limiting permits? I mean, you would not be in a situation where you'd have an artificial uh, shortage. I think people envisioned with Prop 19, and maybe just because we didn't identify this as such a huge problem in our own community, it's our first time out the gate, it looked like less, fewer, larger facilities is what the outcome would be. I don't know if that's what it looked like, but that's what the perception from the grassroots was. Um, you know, let me also say, you know, in terms of the questions of where, where is the big money going to come from, right? So one is going to be the billionaires who have, or new billionaires who have put it in the past or may put it in the present who care about this matter of principle or whatever. Second one might be the unions, right? Now the unions, UFCW and others are getting interested and there's, a, there's some consideration of trying to do a statewide regulatory initiative in California that might be along the lines of what Stevie D was suggesting and maybe pick off the Colorado model. Um, you know, then there's the ones like what Richard Lee did, who surprised everybody by putting in a million and a half or whatever his own money to get this thing on the ballot. What I can say with respect to the first group, from, from my knowledge of them, is that what they typically go for is they like the number one thing they like, well, the number two things, they, I should say. They like bold and winnable. It's bold and winnable. I think at this point, try, I mean, making the pitch to these guys where it's, you know, they're hedge fund guys or big guy, whatever, that, you know, let's do, for example, this, the tricky thing on Montana, right, was to try to even explain what that was about to get to the level of, you know, saying here's why this state should be at our priority one. The notion of putting something like a medical marijuana regulatory scheme coming from the money that's not already involved in medical marijuana it's, it's an extra number of steps to explain why this is important. It, it, the bold piece seems to be missing. It has to be explained in terms of the strategic sense. Now, on the other hand, I mean, you look kind of rationally, you're saying, well, if you look what the feds are doing and you look how important statewide regulation is and how it seems to be one of the things that's protecting places like Colorado or like New Mexico, which has a hostile governor, right? It, strategically, it makes a lot of sense. 
Now, what some of the bigger donors are more intrigued by now is legalization. But the problem you have with legalization is they want winnable too. Legalization is bold, but is it winnable, right? That was a question with Prop 19. It's gonna be a question now with Colorado and Washington, where in both states you have support in the low 50s and opposition in the low 40s, which is not the kind of margin of confidence you would want. It's never been a winnable margin, right? So looking for that place that's gonna combine bold and winnable, that I think is gonna be the thing that brings those guys in from that side. From the union perspective, from the dispensary owner's perspective, it's, it's going to be a different story. I think it's going to be more narrowly focused on specific interests. And I think part of what I'm going to be trying to fight for is to make sure that in all of this, we're not losing sight of the interests of individual consumers, that that needs to be kept first and foremost at the front of the <coughs> pack of concerns. I'd want, oh, sorry. Yeah. ...interest to be involved in the regulatory process. Um, it, that the patient consumer needs to be involved in the regulatory process. And I from where I come from, and grantly, granted it's sort of a wonky background, but the devil is in the details. And when the consumer patients aren't paying attention to how these regulations get structured, because what regulations are about is about who gets the money. And, and when there's very few um, distributors, you're gonna drive down quality because there's less competition. When you have people who have, have to assign themselves to a single grower, it means there's no market, market pressure to drive quality, to drive price. So I get very surprised. So, so people tend, especially the, the patient consumer, to be very involved in these broad issues, you know, the legalization, these, these very broad things that are, um, have a big emotional component. Um, but you can win those things and then still lose in terms of getting what you want. Um, so I think that when we were shaping the, the regulatory system for businesses, that's not just about the interests of businesses, it's about the interests that the consumer does need to be at that table, as well as all these other groups. I mean, there's issues of energy efficiency, there's, um, you know, organics. I mean, we need to bring all these different interests to the table, um, community interests in creating a regulatory system, and I wish they would show up. So I wanted to talk for a minute because, I mean, I think what we're really, this, this panel's almost turning into a medical marijuana versus legalization. And, and so I wanted to address that for a minute because, um, I mean, right now in Colorado with the feds pretty much leaving us alone, I mean, who here thinks that that's probably a very fragile thing? <laughs> that was my thought. Um, and I think every, everyone kind of feels that way that we need to proceed cautiously, that we, we've created something that works there. And um, now, now my group has decided to stay neutral on the legalization initiatives, but I think that would be one of the main concerns that everyone is expressing is that if we go with the legalization route, are we going to just, are, are, are we going to invite the feds to come in and just take everything down? And this wonderful movement that seems to be uh, growing and somewhat solid is going to be completely undermined. Um, but I, I guess one thing I wanted to put out there is because I, I know with a, a lot of the folks who are more pro-legalization, they, they see medical marijuana as maybe being a, a stepping stone or as, you know, is not, is not really what we, what we want. It's uh, uh, maybe a compromise or something or as good as we can get. But um, I think one thing that, uh, in, well, Steve wrote a paper Sorry to bring this up here with you right here, but uh, the wellness, not intoxication that I, I will plug right now, because I think one thing that that paper kind of showed us was that, you know, medical marijuana, we, we can, if we use this wellness way of talking about it, it is such an expansive, I mean, if we really wanted to do an expansive interpretation of it, um, it is, I mean, it, it's almost like legalization to a certain extent. I mean, but we're just fr changing the frame that we're talking about it, that all marijuana use is in fact medical or about wellness. And um, so, so many of the problems that we all see with medical marijuana actually kind of go away when we start talking about it in this expansive sense, but all of the benefits of the medical marijuana movement actually stay in place. Those benefits being that it's extremely popular and that the feds have been leaving it alone. And of course, I'm sure that we could if we push the envelope too far, then 
we risk, uh, obviously, the Fed's interfering and uh, the popular support going down. But um, it's just something that we need to think about, that uh, we have some stability right now, and, but obviously things might be more fragile, and we just need to proceed cautiously. Rob, you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things about Colorado in particular. Uh, first, I want to tweak what Ethan said about the, the polling. He's correct that it's probably the polling is about 51, 41, or something like that in Colorado. But it actually is winnable uh, in the sense that what we've seen when we've run marijuana initiatives during presidential elections is that if three things are all true, then we win. Uh, first, presidential election. Second, because the young people vote uh, in, in large numbers during presidential elections. Second, if we have a big ad budget. And third, the opponents do not have a big ad budget. And so in Montana, Michigan, and Massachusetts, our numbers actually rose during those three campaigns because all that was in place. And so if we're at 51% now in Colorado, we have a big ad budget, which is about $2 million, which we haven't raised yet, but we will. And then the opponents have almost no ad budget, which is highly likely we could actually go from 51 to 55 or 56%. So. In terms of bold and winnable, I would say it is bold and it is winnable. In, in terms of, the, in terms of the, the money for the Colorado campaign, getting back to the topic of this uh, discussion, money, uh, so far in terms of the signature drive, you know, we've spent, uh, we're two-thirds of the way through, MPP is funding almost all of the signature drive, and none of that money has come from the industry. It's all from the traditional philanthropists, whether it's someone giving $25 or someone giving $5,000. So the industry is not involved in paying for the signature drive. As Mike pointed out, his industry organization uh, is going to be neutral. There's a lot of folks in the industry, whether they're part of MIG or not, who are going to give probably no money on our side, and they're also going to give probably no money to oppose us. So the industry, while I wish that weren't true, the industry in Colorado is probably not going to be a player financially. Will the folks that Mike works with and the other uh, dispensary operators, are they going to vote yes in the, in the, in, when they're voting personally? Yes, they will. Are their patients going to vote yes? Almost all of them will. So the, the, it's not to say that they're irrelevant. There's going to be a lot of people voting in the right way from the industry. But in terms of money, this initiative is not going to pass uh, with industry money. Uh, we're going to go to the audience. Uh, I just wanted to bring in the libertarian steam shovel for a second and say, uh, in, as we saw with beer and wine and with air travel actually and trucking and even uh, telephone services, that deregulation, almost all of which began under the underrated President Jimmy Carter, uh, led to much lower prices, much more consumer choice. Is that principle applicable to the debate over uh, legalization versus medical? And if so, does, there, does anybody doubt that, that would, that's what would happen? Uh, yeah, let me, uh, one comment on this. I find, personal, speaking personally, and this does not reflect in a, a, you know, a board approved DPA position or anything like that, my preferred model for legalization would essentially be if you could legislate into it existed something like the microbrewery model or maybe perhaps the vineyard model, something that would allow for large numbers of small producers to stay involved in this thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that would avoid the Marlboroization or Budweiserization of the movement, Debbie's fear, Express fear about the big players taking this thing over. And you can see what happened. If you actually go towards more of a free market, Tim, in response to your thing, what will happen is you'll have major, I mean, you know, tobacco, alcohol, pharmaceutical industries will buy out the best, most talented players in the field today. They will start producing high level quality stuff. And you'll see what could be a sort of you know, conglomeration of a small number of players. It would bring price way down. Then you'd have a debate with public health about what the tax level should be to try to reduce some of the harms associated with the misuse of marijuana. But I have to say, in trying to generate enthusiasm for this notion of the microbrewery model, especially among the major, it's a real challenge. I'm surprised how not just sort of right-wing libertarians, but even sometimes the more left-wing and progressive libertarians say, don't worry about it, Ethan. Just let's get this stuff legal one way or another. And, you know, trying to legislate into an existence a microbrewery or vineyard model or a high-end cigar model, you know, one of those types, it's too much trouble. I would love to see those who, in, those who have the real interest in the microbrewery model, together with the public health people, together with all the anti-prohibitionists among us, that those be the key players at the table figuring out how to make the, how, what the, the best post-legalization you know, model looks like. 
follow up on that. I, I don't know what the, why it, whether it's medical or whether it's adult use. I think this country in some ways has forgotten what regulations are. You know, they either think they're overly restrictive, terrible things or, or we don't have any and that's terrible. And regulations just, to me, what they're supposed to be about is some base level standards that ensures the communities and the individuals and worker safety. So if you can meet those standards, that's all that pay to play should mean to me, is can you meet those minimum standards? And once you do that, then you compete based on quality in a free market. And the balance then between the government, you know, creating safety standards and then the market exerting pressure for then who among those who can compete are the best will lead to consolidation inevitably, but it's consolidation based on quality instead of consolidation based on rigging the game for certain players. You know, um, I personally <clears throat> would like to see, I think, something similar to what you would like to see, uh, Ethan, but I'm suspicious of ever having the government jump in and start trying to, by means of regulation, uh, favor one particular business model over another. Uh, and furthermore, I don't think that the talented master growers of California, Colorado, Michigan, and the rest of this country need that kind of assistance. I think what we need is a level playing field. What we need is for the government not to favor the big players or the small players. Allow us all to compete because some consumers, patients, are going to prefer medicine that's grown in an industrial way by fairly semi-skilled folks using commercial techniques right, that they can get at a lower price. A whole lot of other people, maybe the majority of them, are going to prefer to pay a little bit more and purchase cannabis that's been grown by a master grower in a small plot with organic techniques very carefully tended. I think the market can sort that out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm looking forward to the Solyndra variety of weed, uh, but uh, we have an audience question, so. Uh, I'm Ed, doctor from Montana as well, <clears throat> and we better get back soon. The other half of the state is missing us for sure. Um, <laughs> One thing in Montana, I, I drive about a thousand miles a week. I've been doing it for over a year, organizing this industry in Montana, having a hell of a time doing it, putting a lot of miles on, but meeting the best people. And I, my question would be, why don't we learn from history as an industry? And I ask everybody in Montana this. So when the timber industry gets sued by the environmentalists, the timber industry raises prices across the board. The timber industry doesn't have 12 nonprofits trying to run it. Every industry in this country ends up like every industry. And until we really grow up and act like other industries, raise our prices across the board, have true unity, we will never succeed. And the Montana model is working. We, are, we have most of our dispensaries on board. We're actively going after every, I don't let them alone. If they don't come to a meeting, I come to them. Or I have somebody else come to them. This is very serious. So anyway, what is your opinion why we don't act like other industries in other states. I understand Rob says, you know, the money well comes from the billionaires to start. Well, it has to, because there's no industry to make money. You know, in New Jersey, there was nobody making money off of selling marijuana legally, so you do have to get it. Montana, we did get a kick to start our medical, but it's been up to us ever since, and we're doing a hell of a job. We've raised $170,000 in the last six months per capita. That's pretty amazing. And I would like to, you know, this Montana model well, does work, and why don't we stress acting like other industries? Why don't we raise the prices industry-wide? This, the only thing we have to fight this drug war are legal marijuana sales. I, I don't know. I mean, I know that in California, we've taken it as our mandate to try and lower the price of medicine to patients uh, rather than, than raise it um, out of a feeling that this is a very valuable medicine that's needed by a great number of people, that one of the first casualties of an illness uh, is folks' financial, economic situation. And so um, we've always done everything that we can to bring the price down rather than, rather than raise it. I think that's the appropriate thing for us to do, is at least as long as we're in a medical cannabis paradigm. And I just want to add, when, when it's, uh, the prices in Montana actually dropped significantly. They're very low. And so it, when Ed was saying even raise prices, just what we've been thinking about is just what if we had a dollar per transaction fee and that dollar could go, and this is not something we're doing, it's something we're talking about, and what if that dollar could go to supporting the efforts? So it's not really about raising the price $100, it's, it's about this dollar. And then even that now is being 
dis discussed as, you know, what about people, waitresses, they come in with their tip money to, you know, buy their $10 worth. So is, should they be paying that dollar every time compared to someone who has, you know, more money in any given time? So even now it's gone from a dollar per transaction to perhaps, or, you know, $10 a month or, you know, so it's, we're not talking about a big price raising here. We're just thinking, we, you know, we just, the businesses who have been supporting this are just exhausted. I mean, that 170,000 we've raised, how many businesses does that represent? How many? 40. 40 businesses are supporting the entire effort in Montana. Oh, I, I think uh, it'd be a great idea to ask your patients for contributions in, a, in an active way. Whether you want to make that mandatory or not, I don't know. But certainly, you know, if at, 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 I think at every transaction, it's like, and, you know, we are asking every patient to contribute a dollar. Most patients have been doing that, and it's really important. Would you be willing to do that? Next, next question. Uh, this is a question about how we spend our money wisely on regulation, and it, uh, it's, it's sort of in response to something I've heard from a couple people here, and it's primarily, I guess, uh, for Debbie and, and Steve. Um, Debbie mentioned that uh, there's a danger, and I agree, in having the people who are the entrenched business interests being the, being the only ones sitting at the table coming up with regulations, and there's a danger there that uh, the, the medicine quality will suffer, patient, quali uh, patient care quality will suffer. Um, at the same time, what I've observed, and I think what many of us, many of us have seen, is that in cities that have, uh, that have regulations that do limit the numbers of dispensaries, I think we've seen some of the best dispensaries come out of those jurisdictions. Uh, and I would compare Los Angeles, which is completely unregulated, to Berkeley and Oakland, which do limit the number of dispensaries. I don't see any dispensaries out there that provide better quality medicine or better patient care than BPG or Harborside. And you don't see that in a, a city like LA, where it's sort of out of control regulation. So the, the question is really how do we balance not allowing the, the entrenched business interests to set regulations that only benefit them and hurt patients while still creating a system that allows for groups like a Berkeley Patients Group or a Harborside to really thrive and provide great quality service and great quality medicine to their patients. Well, I think we keep doing our job as activists. Say, for example, in San Jose, we have 90 taxpaying collectives there. Um, they're not all activists because they don't all know how to be activists. And I think a lot of us in the room came to this after something negative happened to us. You know, when you start asking around why we're at, at the table, a lot of times it's because one of our loved ones suffered or we got busted and then we became activists. For example, I think that one thing that is a problem is you see what's happening in the Netherlands. I think they got comfortable with the fact that there was coffee shops all over the place and they forgot that they had to be activists and they had to still remember how to fight. And I feel like that could happen here to us in the United States if we forget that as our movement goes forward, we're still a movement. 20 years from now, the feds could come and crack down and shut down our system too if we forget that we don't have to primarily be training our own people to interact with government, to understand how the system works, to lobby, to raise funds, and to get themselves to the table. And what I did want to mention is at Berkeley Patients Group, we had a couple of real game changers at the city level about, about finances. One was when we showed up to a meeting with our head of our planning department, who was like scratching his head going, I did the math and per square footage, you guys are now the number one sales tax paying entity in the city of Berkeley. Well, welcome to the table. And we were like, great, you know, okay. And then, uh, then the next time it was when we were with the city attorney and the, the city attorney said, well, scratching his head, wow, you guys are one of the top 25 taxpayers in the city now. How did that happen? Come sit at the table again. So um, I think the cities really, really uh, uh, pay attention because they, they want our tax dollars. And just to say one quick thing about San Jose that just drives this point home, which I don't know if it's the exact question, but in, um, in the city of San Jose, uh, we had to do a referendum because a bad law passed. They wanted to ban dispensaries. They were supposed to all close two days ago. But when we pulled the citizens, because we see pushback in cities where we do referendums, the government makes the law, if we want to block that law from going into effect, it makes them pretty mad. And their pushback has a tendency to be a complete ban. But what we found in San Jose through our polling, 78% of the citizens were absolutely opposed to a ban, only for one reason. It wasn't because of the patients and it wasn't because of the jobs. That was our reasons. Their reason was because of the $300,000 of tax money coming into the city government every month that they didn't want to see it go away if the city implements a ban. Next question. Oh. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, I'm sorry, lost my train of thought. Pass on. Okay, yeah, next question. I had it and it's gone. 
Um, hi, I wanted to address this to, to the panel and specifically to Ethan. Um, my name is Cheryl Schumann. I'm the director of celebrity media and public relations for Cush Magazine. Every single month, I am in at least 500 different collectives. I talk to my clients all the time. They all want to know how they can help. I love the idea of doing a dollar per eighth donation, and I really believe that the people that I work with would be interested in supporting that, especially in the past couple of weeks. Everyone has come to me and saying, Cheryl, and quite frankly, just so you know, especially in Los Angeles, a lot of the collective owners don't even speak English. I usually have to deal with them through interpreters. So I truly believe that it's a lack of knowledge and education is the reason that they're not supporting you. A lot of them I speak to say that they don't know who Normal is, who DPA is, who ASA is. They just don't know. So they come to me saying, how can we help? And I would really love to help you. So please let me know how I could help you in that way. Oh, I love that. <laughs> you know, thank, I mean, I, mean I, I will say, and this is also sort of a, per, I'm just being very frank and personal here. There is this thing about having raised millions of dollars to change the laws for ballot initiatives to allow this industry and open up this opportunity, which people have run through. And, done, and I, I sometimes get frustrated because, in fact, the amount of money that gets comes back to Drug Policy Alliance is infinitesimal from people who have benefited from those law changes. Now, it's also true, Cheryl, that most people don't know about my role at DPL. We were behind the scenes. We deliberately had these things look like they were coming, and they were to some extent coming locally. But uh, it would be enormously empowering, you know. I mean, when, De when Debbie talked about the fantasy that we've we, we've heard from all of us, but especially normal over the years, that if only every marijuana consumer would donate that little bit for every, it, it would of course transform the whole thing. Uh, well, I mean, I think part of it is is just educating people that there's these organizations out there like MPP, like Normal, like ASA, like DPA, that have played a pivotal role in opening these things up and that they're representing and advocating on behalf of, of their interests. I mean, I think that's the key. Would this, would this consist of having like a donation bin for like any other charity, like the Red Cross that they have? I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, that's a good question. We'll talk about it after, about how to do that. Ethan, they got their checkbooks open. I, I love it. Okay, Next we'll talk. Question. We'll talk. We'll talk. Hi, I'm O.B. Gold. Uh, Richard Lee is extolled for giving a one and a half million dollar contribution and he's excoriated because of that. But the public perception in Los Angeles, and I think the feds feel this, is that this industry is producing hundreds of millions of dollars of cash. A one and a half million dollar contribution from a large dispensary in LA might represent 10 or 20 days of profit. Where is this money going? Is it going into coffee cans, offshore accounts? Or is it fiction that the money even exists? It's fiction. It's total fiction. That money is like the biggest hot potato in the industry. You know, it, it comes into a dispensary and it's spent immediately on social services, on staffing. The cannabis cost is still can be upwards of 65% of the cost of doing business. It's huge. Um, the city governments now in San Jose, they're taking 10% of the gross income. Why are they so happy? 10% of the gross income. They're the biggest, you know, beneficiaries of the medical cannabis movement. It's, a, it's the city government. At the dispensary level, I can tell you after 11 years, we are not for profit and we take that to heart. Our books are looked at in a lot of our communities by our city governments, certainly by the SBOE. We assume the IRS is in there looking at it. The feds are in it all the time. At BPG, money would come in. If we didn't have a social service or an in-house service or our staff was paid, we'd give it right over to MPP, D DPA or to a, another project that we could put that money into. And literally, we treated it like a hot potato. If we don't get this money to work right now, the feds can come and take it from us. And we all set up our companies just like that. Get it in, get it out to do something for the movement. We have lots of hands and not, not much time. So please, questioners and answerers, please uh, keep it quick. Next question. Uh, hi, my name is Rose Habib, um, was the volunteer coordinator of the um, SB 423 initiative referendum in Montana this summer. I coordinated the over 400 uh, volunteer signature gatherers that managed to get that issue back on the ballot in 2012. And uh, as, as Kate mentioned, we were initially led along uh, for quite a while, um, which was extremely kind of dysfunctional to the end goal uh, of whether <laughs> we were going to get extra money to get the law suspended. Now, in the, in the nature of bold and innovative, as you were mentioning, I think that Montana is, is, is often overlooked as a conservative or Republican state where it can't be one. And I think that this, the interaction that we had with our citizens this summer 
uh, disproves that dramatically, and the dedication that our volunteers had this summer proved that dramatically. Why do you not think that Montana is winnable? And I think that we have a very, we have a very libertarian uh, state, not necessarily a conservative state, and I think it would be bold and innovative to dedicate money to working on legalization there. And frankly, as Montana, we would be a cheap date. Well, uh, I actually think that Montana is winnable. You know, when we ran the initiative in 2004, the polling for medical marijuana started off at 57%, and we ultimately passed the initiative with 62%. So that was an example of Montana being winnable. I think the, the problem uh, with what happened recently is that a lot of industry players, uh, whether or not they have money, or to whatever extent they have money, a lot of industry players think, well, someone else is going to pay for whatever this problem is currently, politically, and so therefore I'm just going to hold on to my money. And I actually talked to uh, a couple of major players in Montana when the legislation was first getting introduced to repeal the law. And they said, well, let me look into it. And they looked into it for about one hour and, uh, and came back and they said, oh, we just determined that there's no way this bill could pass. And I said, look, man, you're wrong. Like, you're a business owner. You don't, you're not political. You told me you're not political. Trust me. $100,000 kills this bill. If you don't pay it now, you're going to pay a lot more later in whether it's coordinating a signature drive or whether it's lobbying the legislature later, it's gonna cost you more than 100,000. And uh, I failed in my ability to raise any money uh, to prevent that bill from passing. It was one of my greatest fundraising failures. Uh, and as a result, now the work that you're doing, and, and thank you for doing that, uh, the work that you're doing and others is gonna be, it's much more laborious. There's still a chance that that referendum's not even gonna go our way. And therefore we still might have a bad law in Montana. And, and so this is just an example of how money up front is more effective than money later, and also money up front will cost less than, than money later. As for legalization in Montana, I do think it's winnable, but not in the near future. I think Montana would be a good candidate for legalization in 2016 if the medical marijuana situation gets straightened out before then. Just a quick add-on to that. When we t talk about money being spent, we, be sh we should be spending money on candidates. We should be involved in races. We should be electing people that actually do the right thing, defeating the people who don't, rather than just kind of waiting for the bill to happen and go, well, what the hell are we gonna do now? Uh, next question. Can I, oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Can I speak to that? And I just wanna say in Montana, you know, we have, you know, Rose coordinated the effort to get this bad piece of legislation on the ballot for the citizens to vote for. We've got the lawsuit that hopefully gets rid of the law completely. We're also organizing a single issue voter campaign. You know, so like we in Montana are coming at it from all fronts and on our own. And um, I mean, I think we have actually a very sophisticated game plan and, um, and just like I say, no support, which, um, it, in, and I would say, and it doesn't matter, we're still doing it, so. Uh, I've been thinking about Ethan's uh, bold and winnable statement uh, for a while, and, um, and I'm just wondering if, uh, well, obviously there's that inherent tension in bold and winnable, so, uh, and, and you mentioned the funders' desires to just make it legal already, so I wonder if, um, don't you think that the funders might be willing to take a couple of losses to get to the, to the greater, uh, just like you were saying for Prop 19, creating a whole conversation, do you think that that might change? You, you know, I'll tell you, what, 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 what's, what's common among them is this thing, because many of them are businessmen, hedge fund, they're basically, they like to bet. Sometimes it's, inter it's easier to raise a raise million dollars of non-tax deductible money for a ballot initiative than it is to raise a third of that amount tax deductible for a nonprofit because they just see it's win or lose come election day. That's what they share in common. That said, each one is an individual and they're incredibly idiosyncratic. Um, you know, we're raising money from guys like that, it, what captures their imagination, their confidence in me or somebody personally in this thing, you just never know. 
Um, the, the winnability thing, I, you know, when, when George Soros decided to put the million dollars in at the very end of the campaign last year, to some extent, was, that was a matter of his coming to a level of personal comfort that he was finally going to cut, he'd been ambivalent about legalization versus decriminalization for many years. And finally, last year, he came to a, you know, okay, it's clear, yeah, I got to be on the record, make it legalization. And to some extent, his putting a million dollars at the last minute, even when he knew that it was a long shot for Prop 19 to win, was almost like a personal personal statement on his part, right? And I think each of the donors are going to look at it differently about what risks they want, they want to take on this thing. I wish that they were willing to put big money on the table and roll the dice big time on Colorado or Washington or the other things picking, uh, popping up. I hope they will. I'm going to try to persuade them. But at the same time, my credibility depends upon my being straight up with them about what are the possibilities here. Ethan, the, uh, the, the polling on Prop 19 continued to go down during that period when Soros made the million dollar contribution. And uh, so what is, how has that changed? I mean, in, the, in the, the, the type of money that we get today, is it different than the type of money we used to get? Well, uh, huh. I mean, basically, if you think about it, Prop 19 involved Soros, Zimmer, and Lewis each putting in about a half million dollars. And then a bunch of other guys, you know, Lawrence Rockefeller, Richard Dennis, John Sperling, you know, putting in 50 or 100. Then when they came in on respect to the initiatives, all the medical marijuana is 98, 99, 2000, they basically went together, the three of them put in a comp combined $8 million um, for a whole swath of initiatives between 90 uh, in 98. And then they put in about the same thing with Prop 36, the treatment initiative, a range of other non-marijuana and finish off marijuana initiatives. Now there's the potential for them or others to put in at that level again. But when, when we start talking about, well, this can only be one if we have a $10 million campaign or $12 million, one thing that's intimidating about California, part of what makes Colorado and Washington look more appealing is that they're smaller states. They got four million people, you know, one or two major media markets. Um, you can do an impressive ad campaign if you got three or four million dollars. Three or four million dollars in the California market, even if it's really strategically done, yeah, it's hard to get above all the noise. Next question. Yes, it's about uh, not so much money, but the uh, don donate, donating legal resources. We have Covington and Burling, the food and drug industry law firm. They've done a lot with Raish, for instance, with medical marijuana, and they have a food and drug attorney assigned primary responsibility for advising the Drug Policy Foundation. In my blog, Freedom of Medicine and Diet, read the article, Coca, come back. My question is, what can we expect from, let's say, Covington and Burling for more legal activity, such as was done with Raish? I, I guess I'll let somebody answer this, but I think we've got to keep our eye on the prize. It's great to be bold, but it's not great to be bold and stupid. And we've got to be careful about what we can win and then what we try to do, and if we lose, the, back, the, back, the backlash for that. And if, if we're at a state now where we're like looking at the federal government and the Department of Justice, and they're essentially saying, if you comply with state law and don't spook the horses, we'll leave you alone. If you comply with state law but then start spooking the horses, we won't. And I think we need to be careful as we try to push that envelope that we don't push too soon because then that just triggers them. Then to do that, then we could actually get stepped back four or five years. In the gay rights movement, we didn't start out running marriage everywhere. We started out with little things, built up momentum, public opinion at the same time, and then struck strategically based upon really, really good research. Because I, mean, I disagree in Colorado. I live there. I've done politics there for 25 years. And it, in, in 2012, good luck. I'll place a bet. Okay. I just want to say something about uh, the pro bono work. It's very hard for us to get in this movement right now because there's a perception that the dispensaries are just rolling in funds that they can put into the nonprofit world. And why don't the dispensaries pay for all of this? But the reality is, and I think it's a message we need to get out, that the dispensaries are a, a, not, a not-for-profit and a non-profit industry that actually is struggling to build an industry. And the money isn't coming from the, the dispensaries. Uh, and it is to some degree. But I think uh, you'd be amazed how hard it is to find people that want to chip in pro bono for their time when they're chipping in pro bono for a $2 billion industry. It doesn't work that well. You know, I think that there's a, um, a, a couple things to note in terms of monies coming in from dispensaries. Uh, one of them is that when political goals and business goals 
are closely aligned with each other, ideally perfectly aligned with each other, it is possible to generate an impressive amount of cash out of this industry in a short period of time. What we just accomplished in San Jose is, is, is actually just one of four similar experiences we've had in California over the past year. Four different referenda, largely funded by the industry, um, and it, all of them were in response to bad local ordinances that would have closed the dispensaries down. But all of them had the effect of pre preserving safe access and, and getting definite electoral wins on our side of the column. So that's one thing to note. If we want to get more money out of the industry and into the movement, then the movement, uh, I think, would be wise to use its imagination uh, to find ways of aligning those business and political goals. Second, one of the things that people like Debbie and myself, who you know really do everything we can to devote as much of our budget to donations to our advocacy organizations as we possibly can, have to contend with, is that there's a kind of self-reinforcing, uh, what I call race to the bottom. As uh, um, uh, Rob noted, there's only about 2% of the industry that's giving in any significant way to the movement. Uh, our competitors aren't doing that. So when we take thousands of dollars a month and give it to the movement, our competitors are using that to compete with us. They're using it to lower their prices or to run more advertising or to do other things that are going to advance their commercial position. So we, as much as we want to devote money to the movement, still have to cover our rears and make sure that we maintain a strong competitive position. And so that's why you may see organizations like Harborside or BPG spending significant amounts of money on what seems to be just purely commercial activity and, and in comparison to what's coming into the movement may look rather small. You have to be an understanding that we are businesses, we operate in a competitive environment, and we have to put our business decisions first because if we don't, we'll get eaten up. Right, we're in the home stretch, so uh, one yes or no answers and one word questions only. Next question. Sorry. This is more than a one word question. Um, I am from Louisiana, and when Amendment 19 got shot down, it got shot down by a lack of support from the growers and whatever. You had 9 million votes cast. We lost by 300,000. Now, my question is, the, the big problem that didn't get the support from the people that are actually growing and whatever was that there was a fear that the price of pot would go down. Well, when you enhance from 750,000 plus or minus possible pot consumers in California to an expansion of legalization, people that can buy to over 19 million possible cannabis consumers, there is no way economically that the price of the goods are going to go down. You've got, you've got, what my question is, is where do we go to unify the pot community to get it passed? Because from Louisiana, California, Colorado, whatever, is where this change is going to be. And we are sitting in a land where there's not even medical marijuana. How can we enhance the unification so the next time in 12 or whenever, when we go for legalization, the pot community is unified to support economically and for the measure for legalization? Well, so one difference between what happened with Prop 19 and what's happening with, let's say, Colorado and perhaps also Washington State, although I can't speak to that personally, is that when Prop 19 was being drafted, it was drafted with a relatively small community of people who were not really willing to seek or listen to input from many people in the medical marijuana community. They didn't seek the input of any growers in Humboldt that I'm aware of. They didn't seek input from a lot of dispensary operators and so forth. And so when you're drafting an initiative in a, in a, in a vacuum, you're probably going to accidentally piss off your own constituency because you're not asking them the questions. As it turns out, they did actually piss off their own constituency. In Colorado, we were very careful 
to have a very large circle of people involved in the drafting. There's the traditional folks like you know Ethan's lawyers and and MPP's lawyers and and other folks in the nonprofit industry. We uh, we sent the draft over to uh, to Mike's team with the the uh, dispensaries that he works with. There's another dispensary association in Colorado that represents smaller dispensaries. They vetted it. And then there's a whole bunch of in-state lawyers that looked at it. So I think that one answer to your question is that you're going to have more unity for an initiative if you make sure that the circle of people who are involved in drafting and editing it is a wide circle. And we have a lot of buy-in. You know, whether or not the initiative passes is an open question, but at least we have a lot of buy-in uh, from our community in Colorado at the present time. Next question. Hi, my name is Anna Ray Grabstein from Steep Hill Lab in Oakland. Um, while people know and think that there's billions of dollars coming from cannabis every year, we also know that because of the obstacles of getting working capital into the industry, many businesses are highly leveraged. Um, every month at my business, I get uh, petitioned from various organizations to support different causes. And while we would love to support everyone, I'm wondering for some advice from the panel about how we choose who to support when there seems to be so much infighting and, and uh, different perspectives of, from people about the organizations that we should be supporting. I'll, I'll answer that one. Well, of course, the answer is give the money to the Marijuana Policy Project, but, but, I'll, but I'll give a more sophisticated answer. Um, and that is that uh, with, with other industries, they set aside a fairly large percent of their budget for government relations and public relations. And, and so let's take it out of the marijuana industry, talk about any other industry you can think of. They spend money on protecting their turf, whether that's lobbying or through regulatory stuff, as well as expanding their turf. And what I've noticed in, the, in this industry, and I, I understand that sometimes the taxes are, are burdensome and running a nonprofit is more burdensome than running a for-profit, and I understand those arguments, and they're good arguments. But it's crucial that this industry set aside some money to at least protect their own turf preemptively so that bad things don't happen, like the, the city ordinance in San Jose or the bill that passed in Montana and so forth. So first protect the turf and then also give money to expand the turf. And so in a lot of cases, I would recommend that the industry pay locally to protect themselves through city regulations and maybe even in the state legislature, but then also to look at ways of expanding, which would be to donate money to see if we could expand so that medical marijuana becomes legal in, in Idaho or North Dakota, South Dakota, and specifically Arkansas, where there's a signature drive happening as we speak. Okay, last question. Oh. Um, let, me, let me make a, I'm sorry, quick comment. I, I, I actually have to catch a flight in exactly two hours, so I would like to thank everybody, and I'm, I'm going to scoot out of here real quick. I've got my business card. If people want to grab it from me on my way out, but uh, thank you very much, and I'll get out of here quietly so you guys can do the last question. So thank you. Can I have one? Can I say something follow-up to that last question as to who to support? I think this is something that gets very confusing, especially for people who are new, newly politicized. And they can get into, you know, who are the, you know, who's on that? I don't like that guy. You know, I don't like that woman. Um, the, this group versus that group, instead of looking at the policy that they're moving forward, having somebody who they can have analyze that policy and play it out, you know, in the ways that it plays out. And you support the policy, you know, that you support. And I think, um, I don't know if it's celebrity culture or something like that. But, you know, I find in Montana people almost seem sometimes it's more about the, the people or the group as opposed to actually looking at what the, the, the policy or the initiative does. And uh, last question, and we're in sudden debt. Um, Colorado, I just wanted to ask about Colorado. There, there seems to be a real flashpoint um, around some issues that Colorado raises, like the status of for-profit industry, privacy issues when you have every transaction tracked electronically and by video, and also these horrible restrictions on out-of-state investment and you have to live in Colorado for two years to be a principal in an industry. If you could say some quick stuff about the, the challenges these things pose for us. Well, I think Colorado's got this one weird situation, which is um, they had this day, you probably know, they made nine million bucks where they said anybody that wants a license for 
cultivation or you want a dispenser or you want to make ingestible food-based medicines, come down, apply. You can get your permit. They paid nine million bucks that day. Every People like us put our life savings. We borrowed money from our grandmas. We put up dispensaries. We spent everything and then found out that the competition was trouncing us out. There's not a market there for nine million dollars worth of licensed medical cannabis facilities. So people have lost their life savings. Some people might be succeeding, but I see a lot of hardship out there. Now, the thing that's unfortunate is that they're going to open that program up because they liked that $9 million day, so they're going to have another one. Um, so if you want a license in Colorado, it might just be available for you, but uh, be cautionary about your business plan and what's going to happen there. It's also, I think, pretty outrageous when you have to pay to apply, much less than you get to pay for the license if you get it. And just because I know we're getting close, I just have to say one more thing, is that there was bad stuff going on in Montana, and that's why we went to our legislature looking for regulations, because we had a core of an excellent, excellent dynamic market. And yeah, there was a lot of crap on the sides. And that's why you get regulations, is so you can support the good and make the bad die on the vine. We, we've, just to wrap up, uh, we've talked a lot, and it seems, uh, there, there seems to be some agreement that it's a, a relatively small percentage of industry money is going toward political campaigning at all. What would change that? Anybody have any ideas? And grassroots organizing. We got to get around and beat the streets and shake the hands and talk to the people in the industry and educate them about the importance and get them involved. Tell them about DPA. I would just say uh, get the goals of the movement aligned with the goals of the industry, even just on an ad hoc basis.